This is Michael Matheson Miller, and you are listening to the Moral Imagination Podcast. Thank you again for listening to the Moral Imagination Podcast. My guest today is Professor James Madden, and he is a professor of philosophy at Benedictine University in Kansas, or Benedictine College in Kansas. And we're going to talk about his book, Mind, Matter, and Nature, A Thomistic Proposal for the Philosophy of Mind. We're going to talk about materialism, dualism, hylomorphism, what it means to be a human person and an embodied person. We're also going to talk a little bit about his new book that he's working on, which is called Thinking About Thinking. Again, philosophy of mind and the meaning of life in an era of techno-nihilism. So we're looking forward to talking about that. And maybe if we have time, we'll talk about another book he's written on fitness called The Ageless Athlete. But I've already convinced him to come back, so we'll have another episode just on fitness and the ages, ageless athlete. And so in addition to his work in philosophy, he is a practitioner of jujitsu and won the 2019 World No-Gi Championship for his rank, which is fantastic. He has six children and is just an active thinker and philosopher. So I'm, I'm really delighted to have Jim on the show today. So Jim, thank you for taking the time to join. Thank you. It's an honor. I'm always surprised when people want to talk to me. So, <laughs> Well, your book is great. I, I like it very much. I mean, I highly recommend it. Now, I mean, obviously, this is kind of a book for undergraduates, graduate students. You know, it's not a super popular book in the sense of a trade press book. It's a philosophical book, but really accessible, really good. And for people who want to understand the questions around what does it mean to be a human person, especially the philosophy of the mind, uh, mind-body questions, the way you go through materialism, through dualism, through different kinds of materialism. And we'll talk about all that. Really, really good. So if you're interested in these topics and it takes some work, but it's super clear. So to all the listeners, I definitely recommend it. Thank you. So Jim, why don't we start? We'll go through a couple of things, but let's let's go through the maybe the big picture of both this book, your next book, and your work, which is really on philosophy of the mind and then what it means to be a human person and this idea this Aristotelian idea of hylomorphism. Why don't we start with kind of your big picture and then maybe we'll, we'll start going through the argument. Sure, and by big picture, maybe why would anybody care about philosophy of mind? Sure. Yeah. yeah. Okay. This is an observation I, I begin the new book with. Okay, so the two most important, at least in the secular world, philosophers of the 20th century, Ludwig Wittgenstein and uh, Martin Heidegger, both became very concerned that what they were trying to do just simply would not and could not be understood even by you know the general educated public uh, that was going to receive it in the 20th century okay and you know Wittgenstein famously uh, prefaces the philosophical investigations with this claim he says you know because of the darkness of our times I, I assume that you know this will hardly illuminate anybody okay and if you follow you know what goes on in in both those 20th century philosophers' later work is they're asking us to rethink thinking, okay? They're asking us or they're or trying to indicate to us or hint to us or help us to remember, right, that our whole understanding of what it means to be thinking, speaking, linguistic animals has been lost. And the fact that we've lost that, they see as obscuring us from ourselves and from the world that we were meant to live in, okay? And, you know, if we, you know, go with the perennial definition of, of humanity as the rational animal, the linguistic animal, or we could say the minded animal, then our loss of what a sense of what it really means to be minded is a loss of ourselves and a loss of, the, of our contact with the world and is, you know, maybe a diagnosis or uh, an account of our nihilistic situation. And when I look at my own work, you know, going back to when I was, you know, a 19-year-old first encountering philosophy, it's, it's really those kinds of questions. Like, like that, what is it to be a minded individual? And uh, what is the connection of that to the meaning of life? That's really motivated me for the, for the 25 years I've been doing this. Yeah. That's great. So, yeah, let's, let's actually go into a couple of those things. So, mm-hmm. you say minded individual. I often talk about ensouled organism or embodied mm-hmm. person, right? And you talked about like, the rational animal, as this means. But... You talk about this like nihilistic situation we're in, mm-hmm. not to start too dark, but the loss sure. of self and this nihilistic situation we're in. I mean, how would you at least start to describe that? And then why does getting who we are as a person, what kind of thing that we are, I mean, what kind of being that we are matter for this? Yeah, yeah. Let, let me uh, 
Let me address that by first maybe doing a bit of a thought experiment about thinking. Sure. <laughs> that might, I think, would show us how far off we are from thinking about thinking the right way. Great. And this is, you know, like all thought experiments, it's, it's silly, but it might help us as sort of a heuristic. Okay. So you've got an individual, um, we'll just call him Smitty. Okay. And, uh, you know, Smitty is having a thought about Paris. He's thinking about Paris. Maybe he's making a judgment about Paris. You know, Paris is the capital of the Republic or something like that. And, you know, in our, in our standard story, we want to say that thought about Paris is some kind of identifiable neurophysiological event that occurs internal to Smitty. Okay. It's an event that's enclosed it's an atomistic occurrence that happens in a place that we can locate in time and space discreetly. Okay. You know, and let's just call that neurophysiological event Zeta. Okay. So you've got Smitty and he's, he's having a thought about Paris and there's a neurophysiological event called Zeta that we, that we know is associated with this. Okay. Now we could get into, you know, it's all very crass from a scientific standpoint. I mean, cause you know, there aren't really discrete brain, events and brains and things like that. So just think about a mm-hmm. global neural network state has happened, right? And this is the one that we can at least see predictively if it happened in Smitty, we would expect that he's thinking about Paris, okay? And the question is, and it seems almost intuitive to many of us now, that yeah, the thought just is Zeta. It just is that neurophysiological event, okay? To that, I, I like to raise these kinds of worries, okay? Let's suppose there was a caveman, Smitty, okay? who exists before Paris is ever, was ever built, before there was ever a city of Paris, okay? And by some, you know, strange quirk, you know, he gets hit in the head with a rock or something like that, and I know this is all scientifically very crass, that same global state of his brain occurs, so that he's in Zeta, okay? I find it hard to believe that we're going to say that the caveman is thinking about Paris when there has never been a Paris, when there's never something he's been in a relationship to that is the city of Paris, okay? Or if, let's say we have a, a neuroscientist, you know, is able to clone a brain and it can put it in this global state of Zeta. Mm-hmm. Is it thinking about Paris? And once again, I, I find that hard to believe, right? That there's some kind of intrinsic connection between that neural pathway and the city of Paris, okay? Now, we do know, or we could know at least, that, you know, something like Zeta is indeed what's going on in Smitty when he is thinking about Paris, okay? But that we also know that's only because there's a long history, right, okay, of human beings in a city and an interaction between human beings in a city, right, and a, humans forming a city and the city in a way forming humans, okay, that makes it such that these are both realities, right, that, that neural pathway and that city, okay? Mm-hmm. So the idea then is, is that, Smitty's thinking about Paris is not something that we can identify simply as that neurological state, because that neurological state could happen even if there never was a Paris, right? And it only is associated with thinking about Paris because Smitty is an inheritor of a history, that Smitty is an occupant of a culture, that he's learned a language, right? The historical events have occurred. So if Charles Mart things break differently for Charles Martel, we're probably not thinking about Paris, or it would mean something very different. Do you see my point? So he's so, as embedded, sorry, so he's, as, he's a person who's embedded in history, culture, yeah. language, experience, and that his thought about Paris, and correct me if I'm mm-hmm. jumping ahead or getting yeah. this wrong, but his thought about Paris, which we're going to call neuro, neurophysiologically Zeta, yeah. is, right, is distinct from the caveman's, even if he both has Zeta, because yeah. it's some kind of relation to reality to right. conforming to reality or something outside himself, at least. Exactly. Did I yeah. following you? Yeah, exactly. You know, perfect. Well, <laughs> exactly. I think you're the only one who's gotten this. Right? So, so well done. <laughs> this is why I get paid literally dozens of dollars a year. Exactly. <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs> <laughs> We're in the wrong business. Yeah, we are. <laughs> but, and so, so the idea here is, is Smitty has to inherit an evolutionary history. He has to inherit a cultural history. He has to inherit a personal history, a family history, a linguistic history. All these things are constitutive of his thinking about Paris. And to identify his thinking with any part of that whole, right, is to miss the thought. And this is not 
to then thereby identify Smitty's thinking about Paris with some immaterial, discrete thing. I mean, so if you if you you know want to imagine a possible world where there's a disembodied mind and there's never been anything like Paris there, and there's some you know image or event going on in this disembodied mind, you know wherever that is, to say that that's a thought about Paris once again, I find that hard to believe. Okay, and that it's you know what, whether minds are brains or minds are ghosts or what have you, to have a mind and to have thoughts with content is to be involved in something far beyond any single individual. It's to participate in a culture, in a history, in a tradition, right? And um, so it's certain, embodied it's, and embedded. Embodied, embedded, and embedded. Exactly. Okay. So in as much now, going back to the nihilism question, okay. Hey, sorry, can I say one other thing yeah, just, to, just to jump here? And I don't want to get us in distracted a little bit, but because I think you, you said something that I want to highlight to make sure I understand, that mm-hmm. the idea of this Smitty with all these histories mm-hmm. that are constitutive of his thinking about Paris, mm-hmm. to identify that thought with Zeta mm-hmm. or to reduce that thought, sure. is that right? To with yeah. Zeta. So it doesn't mean Zeta doesn't, isn't there, right? It's just it's that, it's that to reduce that thought to Zeta is to identify the part with the whole, which is it like... Bennett and Hacker talk about the myriological fallacy, exactly. right? And exactly. Roger Scruton does a lot of work on like exactly. kind of a classic error, right? Yes. <laughs> Isn't that what's, what's, the, what's the Princess Bride? Classic yes. error, classic right? Error. Of myriology, my, 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 classic error, uh, that we reduce multifaceted, complex experience to one part is, exactly. is the kind of classic error. Is that, am I understanding you? Exactly. Okay, and keep on, going. On my view, mind is always something that we do embodied and embedded. We do it in a tradition. We do it in a culture. We do it in a family. We do it in a conversation. It's always something we do. And in as much as we atomize ourselves and think of the world atomistically or mechanistically, we think of the world solely in terms of this billiards ball view of things merely in terms of, of external causal relations and what have you, we're undermining the very conditions of our having minds, <laughs> okay? And thereby you know, facing these sort of, we're losing contact with reality thereby, and we're losing contact with ourselves, and therein lies the, the nihilism at our doorstep. Yeah, interesting. So let's take that just a little further to make it clear. I mean, I think that's, it's really good. I like this a lot how you how you go through this that atomized self like kind of a reduced self like mm-hmm. it's one of again i think one of the kind of difficulties we have in modernity of just reductionism we're looking for right. this oh this explains everything yes. so as opposed to we're embodied embedded but let maybe go further into then what do you exactly mean by nihilism like what's what's the nihilism this loss of self leads to a nihilism i think people would intuitively say, oh, I think I know what he means, yeah. but why don't you try to take it further and be more precise about it? Uh, I, I, I like to think of it in terms of sort of a homelessness, you know, Heidegger's unheimlich, uncanniness, you know, not feeling at home someplace, not, not having a sense of direction. And to go philosophy of mind on it, which is where I want to go, is no longer having definite content to our thoughts because our thoughts have lost contact with the reality, right? Because in my view, the conditions of our having contact with reality is to, is to be embodied and embedded. And increasingly, we, in, our, in our self-conceptions, we're conspiring against that. Yeah. For example? So th- th- what I'm saying, l- l- so for instance, in order for me to have a thought about Paris now, or Smitty to have a thought about Paris, okay, Smitty has to be an inheritor of much. Right? He has to begin with what he's been given by a history, by a biological history, by a cultural history, by a linguistic history. Okay. And in as much as we don't allow ourselves to be receptive to that history, right, to take it up w- what we've been given, we're undermining our condition, the very conditions of our thinking. Yeah. So there's a kind of, you know, and be careful, a small C conservatism in this, okay? Mm-hmm. Um, not politically, but the sense of that thinking can only come online really in as much as we begin with a kind of acceptance or gratitude of what we've been passed down as the ground of you know what relates us to reality yeah well i think the two things i think that you said like there's a conservative in the small c dietrich von hildebrand the phenomenologist mm-hmm. thinker he's kind of platonist mm-hmm. i don't know if you've read have you read any von hildebrand because mm-hmm. he talks about this 
kind of idea of gratitude and reverence before being. Right. And I think you see that in a, in a sense that, I mean, this, I think where the small C conservatism is related to, by the way, the, you know, the name of this podcast is the moral imagination. Yeah. Right. Where Burke is kind of addressing that question as no well. Accident. He's like, yeah. what's that? No accident. Right. Right. <laughs> yeah. But also I think in that sense of that, you're the democracy of the dead, this conservatism is not a sense of let's not have anything change, but it's a gratitude for where you are and a, in a sense of reverence bef- for complexity, right? I'm trying to think how to say this. It's a reverence for complexity, yeah. right? For that, that in fact, I'm grasping a little bit, but I'm embedded in this deep, complex life and history. Right. And now I'm going to engage as a person in a nat- what I'll call a natural for a person, philosophical pursuit to try to understand the world. And so exactly. Plato says that philosophy begins with wonder. Right. But do you think, and so I'm, I'm kind of reacting to you, but so correct me and think, no, I don't, I don't mean that. But do you think in a sense, so the Aristotle, in the, I think it's the beginning of metaphysics says all men desire to know, mm-hmm. right? And then Plato talks about philosophy beginning with wonder. And in a sense, that's an anti-nihilistic way of the world. You're there in the world in reverence to being. And that in a sense, that's part of who we are as human beings. And since we, we've lost this, we've lost ourselves, we've lost our context, we've then undermined our deepest human desire to engage with the world in wonder. Exactly. Did I go too far? No, I think, think you're exact. No, and I'm going to go further. Okay, so. okay. <laughs> if this were jujitsu, you just are going to pin me down. Yeah, no, yeah. Okay, there we go. I'm going to go for the choke now. Um, there you go. I, uh, let me do two polls. On the one hand, you have, as, as you mentioned, Aristotle says philosophy begins in wonder. And when asked, you know, what is enlightenment, Kant says, thinking for yourself. Okay. And now I'm going to give you a very strange example. And, and I want to talk about the two different attitudes we could have towards that. Okay. You know, there's a, you know, simulations have been done by cognitive scientists of termites. Okay. And, you know, termites build these incredible structures, these absolutely incredible cathedral-like structures mm-hmm. that have, there's clear design in this. Okay. And if you look at what the termites are up to, and we can simulate this by giving these, these things just two instructions, you know, grab mud ball, walk till you find another mud ball, leave it, go back, do again. Okay. And if you get this going, you'll get this incredible structure. Okay. And so there's a sense in which there's, there's a, there's something conceptually magnificent going on here, but it's not had by any one termite. Did you see my point? Mm -hmm. There's, there's, there's this incredible, and I'm going to even use like the holy word, you know, concept going on here. Okay. That's had by all the little contributions of these little termites that, that it emerges. Okay. The thing is, is, is the termites never, no individual termite ever sits back and says, you know, gee, is this, is this a good cathedral we're building? <laughs> right. They, they never make the concept explicit to themselves. They never raise it to each other. You know, why, why do we roll the mud balls? Right. Perfect. Maybe we could rent it out to some other termites. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. So, so, the status of the practice never becomes an issue to the termites. So there, there's a conceptuality to the practice that emerges from what they're doing, from the evolutionary history they occupy, from what they've inherited from their ancestors. There is a conceptual magnificence to it, but it's never brought to issue for the termite. They never contemplate it. They never ask about it. Okay. But humans, right, we inherit history. We have to get off the ground by inheriting. We have to get off the ground by just conforming to simple instructions, not unlike termites. But at some point we sit back and ask, but why are we rolling the mud balls, right? What is the point of this? Really, what is mud ball rolling? All these, all these second order questions. Okay? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But no, there's no second order question to be asked until you've mastered the first order practice of just following the basic instructions that you inherited, Okay. So I think you know you can you can kind of go this sort of shared mind view that I have and still say that act of wonder is constitutive of being human. Mm-hmm. It begins with inheritance. Okay. But the loss of self, in a sense, it doesn't eradicate it, but it mutes it so that we're not is this the nihilism that that this reductionist disconnected from our multiple histories yeah. ends up muting our reverence before being, our wonder and our desire yeah. to know yeah. in an appropriate way. Yeah. Is that what you're saying? Yeah. So there, you know, there is something conceptually 
beautiful and in human thinking. And we can make it explicit in our conversation about it, our conversation about it. And the termite doesn't do that. Yeah. Okay. Mm-hmm. But we have to begin with the shared if it's going to be a real conversation. Okay. Mm-hmm. Whereas like, you know, so the, and I think that's really what Aristotle's up to when he says all men desire to know. We all wonder, right? But then a man alone is a beast or a god, says Aristotle. And we can mm-hmm. only do this in conversation. And that means we can only do it with common inheritance. Okay. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's good. Go on the other, the other poll with Kant, you know, what is it to be enlightened? It's to think for yourself. It's to think on your own, to, to atomize yourself in a way. Okay. It's to be disembodied and disembedded. And I would say that is, that is to undermine the very condition of, of there being human thought or thought at all. Right. Mm-hmm. So I'm not an expert in Heidegger and I think, you know, Heidegger quite well. So if I make an error in the question, feel free to correct the question. But I was having a conversation with someone who knows Heidegger uh, much better than I. And there was, a, there was a sense where, like, I'm not sure if this is exactly Heidegger or whatever. So again, I'm yeah. wading into water. I probably shouldn't. You, you could overestimate anyway. how much I care about that. Let's, you know, just, yeah. <laughs> let's talk. Right, about good. Yeah, so yeah. like, okay, at some point, I'm trying to get this right. So like Heidegger, somebody's like, he's talking about a triangle. Like he could think about a triangle mm-hmm. completely separate from anything. It would just be this like completely isolated experience of thinking about a triangle mm-hmm. and he doesn't need anything around it. I'm not sure exactly where it comes mm-hmm. from, but as I thought about that, that, well, except for the word triangle mm-hmm. and the communication of the word triangle. So like yeah. even the most abstract mathematical thought yeah. is done in a shared inheritance because there's a language to articulate this three-sided figure. Yeah. Yeah. So you could, you can, in a sense have to think, to say that you can have this like completely disembodied, isolated experience of a triangle really doesn't hold once you even think about that you talked about having that experience of a triangle. I mean, it's already like almost embedded already. Well, Sorry, yeah. There's a great example Heidegger gives in one of his lectures. You can tell, it's like he's, he says, you know, he, he says, in logic, we teach you propositions like this is black. And he asks, has anyone ever said that really? This is black. He said, you know, like I might say the darn blackboard is unsuitable for the lecture. You get a sense he was struggling that day, right? Mm-hmm. And that's a real proposition you'll find in the wild, right? But how often do you ever say this is black or this is blue or this is a triangle, right? It's go get me the triangular tool so I can, you know, continue to make something. Do you see that? Mm-hmm. And it's not to say we can't abstract and then we can't step out and have a second order view. But where does the thing, where do we, where do we learn to do it in the first place? Where do we come online? what is the backdrop that we need to be able to think in the first place? And it's that shared view of inherited meaning, right? Like the, the concept of the color black only really makes sense to me because I've been in lecture halls with blackboards. Now I date myself and you know, <laughs> I've liked black t-shirts like the one I'm wearing and all these things. It's already all imbued. Do you see that? Okay. Mm-hmm. This is something I do like to do with, you know, when people talk about qualia in philosophy of mind, you know, where they say uh, something like the taste of chocolate or, you know, the, the feeling of, you know, riding fast on a bicycle are these irreducible qualitative states, etc. Okay. And yeah, that's all well and good, but I don't think I can, you know, separate the taste of chocolate from Christmas memories. Okay. Yeah. Or the feeling of going fast on a bicycle with certain wonderful Sunday afternoons I had as a kid with my old man, right? Mm -hmm. And to act as if there's an experiential atom, like the qualitative feel of chocolate or the qualitative feel of riding a bicycle that actually arises for me that isn't already embedded in a world of history and meaning and love and attachment. And we know all sorts of things empirically from psychology now about, you know, the role emotional attachment takes in helping us the structure of a meaningful world and language and all that, once again, makes me think what, what being minded is, is not something internal to me, but it's something spread out into a world. In as much as we de-world ourselves, to use a phrase from Heidegger, we're undermining the very conditions of our mindedness. Okay, so I want to go back to go through your book a little bit and materialism yeah. and dualism, mm-hmm. but this is, I'm so interested in what you're saying. I want to ask you two questions. Yeah, please do. So one is in this kind of experience, something earlier you were just talking before you were talking about qualia or right as qualia. Are you pointing here a little bit, or does this relate a little bit to the idea of of everything somewhat instantiated, right? In this kind of Aristotelian sense, you're like it's instantiated mm-hmm. in a some type of let's say material experience. Mm-hmm. And yeah. so you're not, it's not even the thoughts about the thoughts still are like 
are connected to some instantiation. I mean, yes. am I getting that connection? And yes. why don't you maybe develop it yes. to explain that better than I just did? <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, I, I think to think is to place myself in a world. Okay. It's to place myself in contact with things beyond me. Right. And it doesn't mean I can't have a second order critical stance to those things. Mm-hmm. But you can make acts of understanding about those things. Yes. And right? that's, and that's the human difference. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. That's the human difference. But we've emphasized one of those things too much, I think. <laughs> right. Yeah. And Aquinas doesn't though. Do you think? No, no. And Aquinas, Aristotle yeah. Aristotle, because like, you'd think, you know, Aquinas, he's a mystic, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, this yours is about a Thomistic proposal mm-hmm. of philosophy of mind. You'd mm-hmm. think like Aquinas is a mystic. I mean, he's good, but he's really grounded in yeah. this like embodied yeah. experience. You think that's fair? I think it's fair. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So we'll come, let's come back to that because I want, mm-hmm. I want to go, but I want to ask you a question. I don't know if I've talked about this in the podcast before, maybe once. I don't think so though. Mm-hmm. So later in the book, you actually talk about artificial intelligence and mm-hmm. strong AI and various things. Mm-hmm. And um, I've had this, this conversation thinking about, so, you know, you have this idea of uploading ourselves to the internet, right? In the transhumanist parts of the transhumanist idea, we can upload ourselves to the internet. And I was talking to a friend about this, so I have to give him credit. So it's Dr. Harry Ballin and I were having this conversation and he kind of started me on this path. And so I've, I've taken it a little further, but this is the experience of like, okay, how are you going to download or upload yourself to the internet or whatever, to servers, mm-hmm. to, 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 to say digitally, to make it mm-hmm. okay. And it goes back to this experience, like the qual- quality and riding your bike. So this is the image. And again, critique it if, if you think it's wrong. Because, But so you're standing outside on a warm summer day with a nice breeze mm-hmm. and you're holding a peach in your hand. You're eating the peach and it's kind of just going down your wrist and first part of your, your forearm, it's a little sticky. And as you're there, you're in the garden and you see uh, maybe your little daughter dancing and the sunlight is shining off mm-hmm. of her hair. And she's having her peach and humming and there's bees and butterflies out and the light shining off the peonies flowers. And you have this memory of being a child. It's a beautiful memory. I want to go there. Yeah, yeah. You have this memory <laughs> of being a child and you have this experience of gratitude that God brought you to this season, right? Mm-hmm. That, you, that you're at this season, but also a tinge of sadness because you know you're going to die. Yeah. And hopefully you're going to die before your children, but you're going to die and you're going to leave them. Right. And, but then you have this also hope that perhaps you may be reunited with them again if there's eternal life. And you have this hope for this. And you have the smell of pine coming in from a grove nearby. How are you going to upload that? How yeah. are you going to download that? Yeah. It's a deeply embodied, embedded experience. How, and so it just seems like this is like a right away, an error of the transhumanist movement. We can't go in there to this in detail, but the error of this idea of, of somehow reducing our, maybe this is the Zeta problem, all of our experiences to zeros and ones. Yeah. It seems to miss the, the fact of our embodied, embedded, historical exactly. existence. What, what do you think about that? Well, I mean, you've just shown yourself to be an expert on Heidegger. I mean, I mean that, 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 was the, that, was the, that was absolutely Heidegger's critique of technological thinking and cybernetics and artificial intelligence right there. Wow. Well, so yeah. well, it was lucky. So I have to give credit to, to uh, Harry Ballin for that. So Thank you, Harry. Yeah. Yeah. John Hoglin, who was, uh, he was at the University of Pittsburgh for a while and then was at the University of Chicago and died rather young, which I think was a great loss. Okay. Worked quite a bit in, in philosophy of mind, cognitive science, and trying to relate that to Heidegger's phenomenology. And Hogman has this famous quip that he, that he would truck out all the time and said, the problem with computers and why AI and cognitive science, you know, are, are kind of not getting what the real problem is. He said, computers just don't give a damn about anything. Hmm. And he says that the, the thing that's missed is giving a damn. Okay. Hmm. And so maybe let's unpack that a little bit. So, well, can, can I say just super fast, I, I did an a interview with George Gilder on AI and also mm-hmm. um, Jaron Lanier and Glenn Weil. So I've done a couple of mm-hmm. podcasts on this. But one of the things that Gilder points out and others as well is mm-hmm. that part of the problem that we're having in neuroscience right now is that we're building, and I was actually talking to a neuroscientist about this recently, mm-hmm. that we're building our models of neuroscience and the brain 
on a computer mm-hmm. because we've built our idea of the human person on a computer. So the, the problem is it's like, it's a circular problem because we right. got, we think, oh, a brain's like a computer. Mm-hmm. Oh, okay. And then we do neuroscience like a brain's like a computer, but yeah. it's not. And it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy then. Right. So right now, you know, in, in the room I'm in, in the room you're in, there are infinitely many true assertions that you and I could both make about those rooms. Okay. But just saying something true isn't enough for us to have a conversation. You know, so if just in the middle of this, I said, oh, and, you know, by the way, uh, you know, I, I, have, I have five toes in my right foot. Okay. That's a true assertion. Me too. Yeah, me too. Yeah, you'd be like, okay, uh, thanks, Jim, but I thought we were talking. Okay. And so, you know, we, out of that infinity of, of semantic infinity that we could use, we sort it somehow. And we sort it basically pragmatically like what we're doing, like you and I, are, we're having a conversation about philosophy. So we're not going to just bring up how many toes we have. That, and that's not relevant. So we sort it. Okay. But what makes our sorting non-arbitrary? Okay. Well, it would seem that's because there's something you and I care about in doing this, right? We're not, we're not just arbitrarily picking some, you know, otherwise meaningless subset of the semantic possibilities that we can engage in right now. It's that we've been both moved to this conversation by, by a common wonder or concern or what have you, you know, it could be many things. Okay. But Mm -hmm. it's it's because we care about something that we have sorted the world this way. Okay. And so you can, and this is what Hoglin means by giving a damn. Okay. Mm -hmm. And he wonders like, what would count for a machine sorting based on care concern? Right. And ultimately that like what ultimately makes us sort in care are things like love and death and our finitude and all of that. Okay. And there's an interesting question. I'm not saying it's impossible, but it's a different kind of question. Like what would it be for a machine, right? Not just to avoid its demise, but to fear its death. Okay. Or Mm -hmm. to have its death, frame it, frame it, frame all its experiences. Right. Mm -hmm. And then we can go even further. Right. And this is, you know, this is more Heidegger stuff is not only, not only do we, sort the word world, not only do we sort it pragmatically, not only do we sort it pragmatically in terms of the, what we care about, but we also in a way, you know, take responsibility for it, you know, so I'm not, so you hear, you and I are, are engaging in the, in the linguistic practice of philosophy. And we've done that because we care about wonder. And that's, and that's helping a world of entities come to be for us that wouldn't otherwise be present to us because we're concerned about this. Well, at some point, you know, we should ask ourselves, you know, does that matter? <laughs> Right. Does, is that really a good thing to be concerned about? Or does the way that we practice wonder, does it actually help us get to the things that we care about and preserve them, et cetera, et cetera? So we, we, we have this gear where we can ask these really dark questions right, about ourselves. Mm-hmm. So let's say, you know, um, I spend much of my day sorting my world in terms of what's necessary to be a professor of philosophy, not just a philosopher, but, a, you know, a, someone who works in a certain type of institution. Okay. And so I can, I should at some point ask myself, does that practice, does that way of sorting the world, is it actually good? And does it actually serve the wonder that I claimed it would when I got involved in it? Which in many ways could, one could come to a very dark answer about that, right? And, and, and say your life is wasted or what have you, okay? Right? Mm-hmm. And so here's an interesting thing, like, you know, is a computer- hey, can I, Sorry, and can I say, those dark answers are always lurking. They're always, no matter what you're doing, yeah. At some point, I mean, those dark answers, even though maybe you are doing something very worthwhile, and people think you're doing something very worthwhile, you still get a dark. There's a creeping darkness. Like, it is. Is it worth it? So it's just, I think, or, or or could could it just all be our collective bullshit, right? <laughs> you know. And does it make any sense to say that a computer could have an existential crisis? And once again, I can't show that's impossible but we're straining credulity here now. Mm -hmm. And, you know, as Heidegger puts it, you know, we're the being for whom being is an issue. And that's the difference for us that we take, we can take that second order stance and we can follow the answer where it leads. And maybe it's something really, really dark, but that anxiety that, that causes us is our sense of ourselves as something, not just one among the objects that we encounter in the world. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's good. It's really, right. 
I mean, yeah, so it's interesting. But I didn't know I was an expert in Heidegger, so. Yes, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I didn't need it until about five years ago. I was like, wait, that's what this guy's saying? That makes sense to me. I can't this guy. <laughs> yeah, you read Heidegger, you're like, wait, what? hold on. Say that again? What? Um, yeah. Yeah. So, good. Okay, so, I mean, this is really good. We could keep going this way. Sure. And we keep we just follow the conversation, and uh, we'll have you back to talk about your book. <laughs> or if you, yeah. <laughs> but uh, no, but it's all related to your book, of course. I'm, yeah. I'm uh, joking a little bit. So let's let's actually then let's go to this big book because you you spent you spend a lot of time trying to think about the philosophy of mind and what does it mean to be a human person. And so you we started the conversation with saying that we're lost mm-hmm. to ourself. Yeah. And part of that's because we don't take seriously what it means to be embodied mm-hmm. and embedded in all these cultures, history, et cetera. Mm-hmm. So let's, let's maybe go into it and start to take, take it apart. There seems mm-hmm. to be three or four dominant ideas mm-hmm. of how to think about ourselves, mm-hmm. and you're wrestling with all of them. Right. So there's materialism, mm-hmm. there's, and then different kinds of materialism. So we'll, we'll talk about it. There's mm-hmm. dualism. Mm-hmm. And then you're positing this Aristotelian to mystic idea of what's called hylomorphism mm-hmm. right so why don't you well let's let's ask what do you think would be good do you want to go through like what's mechanism what's materialism what's dualism or maybe do you want to just take a shot at like here's what hylomorphism is and here's why i get there and then we'll go through the others what do you think is more like better for the listeners what do you think is going to be more valuable so, yeah as far as a Let, let's a start so, i see dualism and uh, materialism, both as species of the genus mechanism. Okay, so what? Let's okay. Let's do, spend some time talking about that. Some mm-hmm. definitions. Sure. And then we'll we'll go through it. Yeah. Go ahead. You know, mechanism I take is the view more or less that everything can be identified as a discrete individual that's related to other discrete individuals by external causal relations. So it's it's the push pull pinball view of the universe. So it, it's aligned with materialism, but you could be a dualist. Yes. Because, I mean, so what's a materialist? It's to say, well, all there are are, there, all there are, are, are billiards balls interacting by, you know, physical causes, okay, external causes. But what's a dualist? It's to say, well, there's some billiards balls that are not located in time and space, but it's all still discrete individuals interacting by push-pull external causation. Okay. Right. So mechanism underlies both dualism and materialism. Mm-hmm. Do you think always, generally? Yeah, I think always. Always. Okay. So, yeah. so mechanism is this push-pull relationship. Everything's it's mechanical, which I think is very interesting because that's, I think, just to jump ahead, why this is so relevant is because we live in a very highly mechanistic, technocratic universe. That's everyone's trying to find a technocratic, technical solution to the problems of evil, sin, suffering, and death. Mm -hmm. And I think that this kind of utopian technocracy that manifests in multiple ways is deeply connected to mechanism and a broad mechanistic view of the world, whether it's kind of Marxist idealism, Nazi Third Reich pantheism, or contemporary uh, kind of technocracy. There's underlying is this mechanistic view of the world. Do you think that's right? The the era of techno-nihilism, as I worked about it, yeah. Yeah, yeah, techno nihilism. Okay, so okay, so mechanism then is this kind of everything is push pull. So it's a way of thinking. The way, essentially, the machine dominates the way we understand the world. Exactly. And while the computer is starting to make its way in, the computer is still a machine. Yes. And this is a me- mechanistic way of seeing the world, and that's that's the dominant that's the dominant thing under both dualism and materialism. Okay. Exactly. All right. So let's. Uh, by the way, I think. Ian McGilchrist, have you read him? Mm-mm. He wrote The Master and His Emissary. Oh, you got to read it. Oh, yeah, you'll like it. Yeah, I'm, yeah, I'm, writing, I'm writing titles down. Oh, yeah, yeah. No, me too. That's the best. So Master's Emissary is about right hemisphere and left hemisphere. He's a neuroscientist and a philosopher. And I don't agree with everything he says. I mean, I think there's, there's errors there. But it's him. just so interesting. He's such an interesting writer. This book is really totally worth reading. But I think he has. he's working on a new book called like, You Are Not a Machine or something like that. Okay. Which I think is a good title, right? Because that's that's a kind of a classic error. Okay, so let's keep going. So you have this mechanism, and then you have two subsets: materialism and dualism. And these are the dominant ways 
that we understand not only the world, but ourselves. Let's focus on ourselves. So why don't you, why don't you then start going through that and explaining the kind of dominant ideas, and then we'll go into why you think they're wrong. Sure. Well, and, and can I kind of put what hylomorphism is on the table? Yeah. Oh, yeah, of course. That's good. Yeah. I'll start with a, sort of a silly example and we'll build our way up. So, you know, I'm sitting at a desk right now. And, you know, we could ask a philosopher's question, you know, whether this desk is identical to the parts that compose it. You know, is the desk just the drawers and the, the feet on the desk and the, the surface and all that? And this is going to be sound weird, but the hylomorphists will say, no, the desk is not identical to those parts. Okay? Mm-hmm. Because, look, I could, I could take that drawer out and we wouldn't say I've destroyed the property of my, my employers. Right? The desk would still be. Okay. And we can replace it with a different drawer and we wouldn't say, oh, I've given the world a new desk. We would say, no, it's still the same desk. Okay. The desk still is. And so the idea there, if you think of it, is to say there's conditions under which that desk could exist without those parts. Okay. Not with no parts at all. That's important. The desk is embodied. Okay. But it could exist with different parts. All right. And those parts could certainly exist without the desk. We could smash the desk to bits and spread it to the four corners of the world and the parts would still be, but the desk wouldn't be anymore, okay? So once you admit that, you're saying there's this interesting relationship between the desk and its parts now. Mm-hmm. Okay? That the desk is a kind of whole that has a kind of integrity that is independent from the integrity of its individuated parts, okay? And it's... There's something very even more interesting about all that is, you know, if I asked you, you know, if, if you said, hey, Jim, count the objects in the room right now. And, you know, I counted my mug once and then I counted the desk drawer and then I counted the desk surface and then I counted the desk in addition to those things. You would, you would say Jim has sorted things in a strange way now. OK, mm-hmm. the mug so, handle. Yeah, the mug handle. Right. So you'd, so it seems at least pragmatically the desk has a sort of ontological priority over the parts. We wouldn't count the parts, we would count the desk, okay? Mm -hmm. Why is that? Well, partly our needs. We're just not concerned about the parts and the way we're concerned with the desk. But also it's because, you know, we wouldn't define a desk in terms of what it is to be a desk drawer. We define a desk drawer in terms of what it is to be a desk. So there's, the point I'm making there is there's a kind of explanatory hierarchy going on here, okay? Where in one sense, yeah, you explain that there is a desk by the assemblage of the parts, okay? But the definition of those parts as what they are is derivative from what we define a desk as in the first place. Do you, do you see my point? Mm-hmm. And this goes further down all the way to atoms. Yes, yes. Which is important. I mean, so it's not just the parts, but then the parts, the raw material of the wood, and then the plastic, the, which comes from the, the petroleum, and on and on, all the parts going all the way down into atoms. It's yeah. not simply... The hylomorphic position of the desk is not simply the composite of its parts. It's correct this if it's wrong, but it's some kind of thing in itself. Yeah, yeah. That's different from simply the composite of its parts. Exactly. We might say it has a form of its own, as it's been famously put. Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And so, the well, so desk- okay. So let's just take a second for that. Okay. Mm-hmm. I think maybe this even we could even think about like you think four causes or something. But what's going to help? Yeah. explain this you know i'm trained in philosophy so i'm following you here on aristotelian form but sure so let's say there's listeners who are like wait i want i want an explanation so if, if you if you yeah. are an aristotelian and you're listening you know don't turn it off just put it on two <laughs> speed bear with, us. Bear, <laughs> bear with us but uh if you're not then i think it, it's worth kind of before you jump into it because i think understanding form is helpful yeah and because i think i think it's an abused notion too so you have to get it right yeah mm-hmm. so I think we've established this desk is not identical to its parts. Yep. Okay. It's identical to its parts involved with each other in a certain way. Mm-hmm. Okay. That involvement of the parts with each other is its form. Okay. okay. And note, then this is, we're moving towards the four causes here, is mm-hmm. there's no way I could define that involvement that constitutes the parts of a desk as a desk without telling you what a desk is for. That what is it that all those parts are involved together to do? Okay. Okay. All right. Now, and so famously, the Aristotelian, you know, Aristotle calls the form of the thing. The, I like to put it, it's the being able is what is it, right? What is the disposition that has to be present among these parts in order for them to compose a whole? 
Yeah. I, I actually, so I like, I like the desk is not identical to its parts, but it is identical to the parts involved with each other. Involved, yeah. That's really good. And the That's involved cool. with each other is the form. And there's no way for me to explain to you what this involvement is. Right. Unless I'm using, unless I'm telling you it's a desk. That is talking yeah. about the form of that yeah. thing. Exactly. I, I think that's, I like, I actually like that explanation exactly. Thank a you. lot. Excellent. Yeah. Excellent. So let's take a living thing. Okay. My, 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 uh, my, my pet chameleon, Bob. Okay. Is Bob identical to his parts? Well, no. I mean, we could smoosh Bob and we'd have all the parts left, but we wouldn't have a chameleon. Okay. Mm -hmm. And moreover, Bob's going to eat crickets and he's going to, you know, eliminate things and, you know, he's going to change, exchange parts of the environment. So he's not identical to his parts. Okay. So what is Bob now? Bob is matter, he's parts, and he must be some form. Okay. Now, mm -hmm. but Bob is importantly different from the desk. Okay. Because, you know, one, it's up to us what a desk does. And almost anything would do as a desk in a pinch. Like I could set my books on a rock if I had to. Okay. Humans don't discover desks. They invent them. Okay. They're artifacts. Bob is not an artifact. It is not up to us what Bob does. Bob is, you know, recalcitrant, right? Like, like all living things. And moreover, you know, the same my desk, if I pull the drawer out and I set out in the hallway, the drawer does not begin to decompose at any faster rate than it would if it were in in composition with the desk. Okay. Mm -hmm. yep. If I, you know, were to amputate Bob's glorious crest that he has, okay. The crest would immediately begin to decompose. Okay. The part has no integrity of its own independently from its involvement with Bob. Mm -hmm. and, yep. I, and I think we can go pretty far with that, even down to like, you know, the, there are molecules in there that are only bonded because they play a certain role in the life of the organism things like yep. that. Okay. So, and that there, you can distinct, correct this, of course, mm -hmm. that you can distinguish them doesn't mean that they're not in a involved relationship. Right. Yeah, right. I think it was the desk from the, the drawer, right? Yeah. Yeah. But they're still involved. Mm -hmm. And, and so moreover, um, there's a set of changes. There's a set of capacities that Bob has that are not capacity. Of he is part. a chameleon. He's a chameleon. Yeah. So he can change. He can change. And he changes in chameleon ways. He hunts like a chameleon. He, you know, he wants to engage in rapturous acts of chameleon reproduction, all of this, right? Whereas the components of my desk are like, you know, the wood is just rotting wood. It doesn't do anything wood doesn't do. Okay. With Bob though, once he's assembled, once they're, all his parts are in relation, once they have the being able of chameleon, now they're doing things. Something new under the sun has come to be now. He's not just rotting carbon, right? He's hunting carbon. He's mating carbon. He's, you know, climbing carbon, all that. Did you see my point? Mm -hmm. Yep. So, you know. I Aristotle, threw a wrench in there by making a joke about a chameleon can change. So. No, 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 no. That's, not, that's exactly, yeah. It <laughs> and it changes, interestingly, under its own steam in a way. Like, it, yeah. It has a direction of its own. It's not just decomposing, whereas the desk is really just decomposing. Mm -hmm. Yep. So is, is Bob a, a compound of form and matter like the desk? Yes, he is. Okay. But in an even more profound way, because of this fact that his parts ontologically depend on him in a way, the parts of the desk don't on the desk, and that there is a kind of sui generis capacity that Bob has that's distinct from the capacities of his parts that you don't find in an artifact. Okay. Mm -hmm. And that's why Aristotle says in living things, he gives a special name to their form. He calls it their soul. He calls it their soul. Mm -hmm. And so in the hylomorphic tradition, and, and no, we have not talked about minds here. Okay. Hylomorphism right. is not a position of the philosophy of minds, a position of the philosophy of nature. Yep. Okay, in the physics. Okay. That, okay. Actually, so that's important. Just, just important. make a quick explanation of it so that it's an yeah. important point. And I don't want it to just kind of go off, especially if you listen to podcasts like I do at one and a half speed. Right. So the, the point is, is, is um, we haven't said, hey, there's a problem with how, how do minds interact with bodies? And let's come up with a way that we can preserve mind, okay, while still being good mechanists about physics, okay? That's not, that is not the problem that Aristotle has. That's a problem that we've inherited. That's not his problem, okay? Mm -hmm. 
Aristotle is just trying to give a generalized account of all beings that are subject to change. Okay, that's what he wants to do. Some of which are alive, some of which are not alive. And in analyzing beings that are not alive, that are subject to change, he, he discovers in, the, in some sense this form-matter distinction. And then he, then he goes and looks at organisms, living things, and says, wait, they too are form-matter compounds, but in a more profound sense. So he gives a special name to the, the soul of a living thing is, is its you know, anima, its soul, I mean, its life, right? Mm-hmm. Its relatedness of its parts such that it, it has this kind of ontological integrity that non-living things don't have. Okay. And so I just think it's important to note that th- this is not – so look, th- this is not mechanism now. We're not saying that, that the world just is the collection of the most fundamental spatial objects that bump into each other. We're saying that there are things over and above those, right? mm-hmm. things like Bob the Chameleon, things like, like Jim and Michael the podcasters, okay, that, mm-hmm. are, that have capacities over and above their parts, that have downward control in their parts, whose being defines the being of their parts. Okay, that are involved in in more complicated kinds of causal relations than just push and pull. Right. It's very important to see that in the in the Aristotelian tradition, at least at its inception in Aristotle. Okay, what a soul is is not a mind. Okay, in the modern sense of mind, right? Mm-hmm. It is that, as we put it in this podcast, that dispositional relatedness among the parts that defines this thing as a certain kind of creature. Mm-hmm. So just to jump quickly for Thomas, St. Thomas Aquinas, right? Mm-hmm. He, many people know this, but many people don't. Animals have souls. Yeah. For Aquinas, Plants right? Soul. Plants have souls. So Plants there's a soul, there's an anima, there's a, there's a yeah. form. Yeah. And then the human being has a rational soul. Right. 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 So, so we said earlier that you know we can only really define the the form of a desk in terms of what a desk does, right? And we can only really define the form of a chameleon in terms of what a chameleon does. So you know what is what does it mean to say that the soul of a chameleon was present in that animal? Well, it's to say it it engaged in a certain pattern of development, okay, mm-hmm. that involved tail growing and crest growing and color changes with mood and certain types of hunting certain types of consciousness, I would say. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so to have the soul of a chameleon is to grow in a certain way, to achieve certain capacities. In the case of a chameleon, they would be, they would be capacities for mobility, for reproduction, for metabolism, and for certain types of rudimentary consciousness. Okay. Well, let's, let's talk about the soul of Michael. Well, what is it? Well, it's a human soul. What is that? It's to, it's to be an organism that engages in a developmental uh, pathway towards certain activities, right? That would include human reproduction, human, human metabolism, human movement, and human consciousness, right? Human cognition, which is something special, okay? But it's the mm-hmm. same in principle sort of explanation that we're going to give for Bob the chameleon. Mm-hmm. So we have this philosophy of nature, mm-hmm. uh, this idea of hylomorphism, matter mm-hmm. form. Mm-hmm. And the form is not, like a bit or a space in the in the matter, so the soul is not like a little place in your in your body. Right. It's the animating principle of your matter, and so and I think let's figure out how to articulate this better, so that mm-hmm. because we're in a post Cartesian world, we're always thinking like dualists. Always. Okay. Always. And always. and I even the materialists are even the materialists are. Oh, totally. Yeah, I mean, this is what uh, Bennett and Hacker do in, yeah. in philosophical foundation. I learned that, I learned this from Bennett initially. Yeah, it's from, just from, from so good. Yeah, it was, it, he calls it you know, mutant Cartesianism, mm-hmm. right? Because the brain has just uh, substituted for for the um, for the mind. So, and well, I want to talk about this. I mean, there, there's something, and you you write about this. There's something kind of intuitively understandable about dualism. Much, I think, much more than materialism. And if you had to choose between those two, materialism seems pretty incoherent to me. Dualism, you're like, well, okay, there's something beyond the fact that we're just kind of mechanistic pins. There's mm-hmm. something outside. But, and we'll, we'll talk about that and the problems with it. But I think the important point here is that because we think dualistically, our first kind of image of what it means to have a soul is that it's almost like the kind of classic error 
that's the theme. Maybe I should call this the classic era podcast. I like, I like that. Uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, of thinking that we're, in, that we're driving around in our body like we're driving around in a car. You know, like, oh, sorry, my body hit you. You know, yeah. that's just a bad image of what it means to be an embodied person. It's, it's a right. dualism. I wish and, I had a different word. I wish I had a different word than the soul. Yeah. But I think anima is interesting because, right? Because it's an animating principle of the form. Yeah. Right? It's that which animates the form. Correct. Again, push back on everything. Well, I'm I would to, say it's our being animated in this way. Our being animated in this way. Okay. Okay. We'll get, We're get on that. this path. We're on this path. We're on this developmental path. Mm-hmm. Right. right. And the way I like to put it is the soul isn't your mind, right? Your soul is your disposition to develop a mind or to, or to develop a participation in mind. Okay. So uh, there's a lot there. So, yeah. but, and also, are you implying a teleology? Yeah. I don't think that, I, don't, I mean, how else are you going to define the desk but teleologically, right? Okay, so let's pause for a second yeah. and talk about, so this goes back to the four causes. So you've got yeah. your material cause, the wood. Yeah. You've got your efficient cause, the carpenter. Yeah. Your formal cause, the, I'm going to go back to this because I like it so much. The parts involved with each other. Right. Right? That's the form. And then you've got a teleology, the final cause. Yeah. Which is, their, what are they involved with each other for, right? Yeah. And just using Bob the chameleon, I mean, so there is a fact of the matter of what a good chameleon life is, okay? Right, you know, there'll be, there'll be cricket hunting and, you know, chameleon dating and all that involved, okay? And all the parts in Bob are organized to that end. However they got that way, that's fine, okay? However they got so organized, okay? At least at the moment, we have a somewhat stable organization that's getting passed down here. Mm-hmm. And what are they organized for? They're organized for that kind of life. Right. And to understand what Bob is, to understand his soul, is to understand the good life for Bob. Right. And therefore, to understand what we are, what kind of being we are, and to understand, and this is an Aristotelian position, gives us an understanding of what constitutes a good life for us. Yes. And that important to note, I mean, I think it's obvious, but sometimes it's worth stating the obvious. That doesn't mean there's, there's also something about the animating for, animated form of the human person that it's not, the good life does not look exactly the same for each person. No, it doesn't. Right? And, and, and also because Bob gets no vote in what a good life is. Chameleon kind doesn't get an explicit vote, right? They are merely a product of the history, okay? Whereas humans, collectively, we are self-conscious inheritors of our our history. Mm -hmm. And therefore, we all have a kind of, as a group, have a sort of vote in where the history goes. Do you see that? Like, Mm -hmm. we can push back against our evolution in a way, or push with it, (laughs) maybe is a better way to put it, that the chameleon can't, right? And so the, the good life is going to vary, but, but, but no, there's limits. Okay. I mean, the, the, there will be limits, right? Cause there, there's an inheritance of an organism here. There's an inheritance of history, what have you. And this is where the nihilistic problem comes in. Yeah. It ends up distorting or clouding any concept of what the good life is. What the good life is. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. So because we're disembodied and, and disembedded. Then. Yeah. Okay. So let's keep, let's keep going. Mm-hmm. So we've got a philosophy of nature. We've got this yeah. idea of, 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 a hylomorphism, matter, form matter, mm-hmm. and that's the philosophy of nature. From there, you take this and say, okay, what is this Aristotelian and then Thomistic understanding of the philosophy of nature? How does this give us understanding of the mind? Mm-hmm. So we could go there now, or maybe it's worth taking at least a couple minutes to say, well, that's hylomorphism. You have mechanism, which is, so mechanism and hylomorphism are very different. Very different. Very different. Very different. And that the two dominant subsets of mechanism are materialism, mm-hmm. which is the predominant worldview, like at least in the academy. Right. And then dualism, which would be probably the predominant view broadly in your lived experience. When I say lived experience, I, don't, I, I want to be careful there because I don't mean that it actually reflects your lived experience. I mean like dualism is the popular way that most people think about the world. but Materialism is the dominant view in the mecha- in the academy, but underlying both of them is a mechanistic yeah. view of the world. You think that's right or pushback? I think that's right. And I think the way I would put it is, okay, anyone who reflects on it 
you know, for five seconds, we'll realize Zeta is not the same thing as thinking about Paris. And you're just going back to the earlier example. Mm -hmm. And the reaction to that then is to say, oh, therefore Zeta must be some, or excuse me, thinking about Paris must be the work of some immaterial separable entity. Okay. Mind. Mind. Yeah. And what that, what we've done then is we've seen the error in mechanism, but we've tried to give a mechanistic solution to it. Yeah. Okay. So why don't you go through those then? That's good. No, that's good. Yeah. So let's go through this. So, so let's start with materialism. That's the big play. I mean, that's where neuroscience is. That's where computer science is. Right. I mean, the dominant way we see the world, I mean, there's a little bit of kind of Berkeley Buddhism sprinkled on top. Mm -hmm you know, spiritualistic feelings. But generally speaking, materialism holds the day mm -hmm. in the academy and media. Why don't you, maybe let's address that first. Sure. What it is, the, the, uh, maybe the different aspects and why it's a problem. I know we could have a whole podcast on materialism, but let's do a quick view. Over yeah, I, mean, I just, I, once again, I think, I think that what materialism is, is just that we can identify every single object as, you know, a discrete entity that occupies space and time. Okay. That if we had a story about particle physics, it would be the absolute final story of reality, right? It would leave nothing out. And I think, you know, so that would say, if you could, even more radically, if you could just give me the story about the quarks composing the neurons, composing Zeta, then you would know all there is to know about thinking about Paris. Okay. And I just don't think we need a really fancy argument to see that that's just plainly false, right? That we, we, could, we could produce such states, you know, such physical states, and they would have nothing to do with Paris whatsoever. Mm -hmm. Right? Yeah. And I think all the arguments against materialism always come down to basically that point. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I actually have. So well, actually, let's move to dualism anyway, because I have a couple of, I have two podcasts with uh, Dr. Michael Egnor, who's a neuroscientist. Mm -hmm. So for listeners, if you haven't heard those, go back and see this is where we talk about neuroscience, free will, materialism. I have another one with uh, Jay Richards on materialism, where we talk about what materialism is and uh, some of the arguments against it. But I, I do think it's it's very and, and and George Gilder actually he talks about too he calls it a he calls it a superstition mm -hmm. he says materialism is just a superstition and I think a, a real serious engagement with it I mean it's popular but it doesn't really hold up to philosophical critique but either does it hold up to lived experience right right so okay let's go to dualism just because of sure. time. Mm -hmm. And if you know what, listeners, if you want to have a longer one of dematerialism, Jim, we'll have you back. And we'll oh, we'll do it anytime. Let me know. Yeah. I love this. Okay. So let, let's, um, but let's go to dualism because that's another kind of the other dominant view. So the materialist mm -hmm. view is basically matter is all we are. Everything that we can, everything that we are, everything that we do can be reduced to our biology, our neurophysiology. And I think it's important, generally speaking, it's pretty hard to escape determinism if you're a materialist. It's pretty hard to have a, a real robust concept of free will if you're a materialist. And I think that's just a weakness there. But yeah. that's materialism, yeah. okay? And yeah, then, sometimes we should do one on free will because I don't think we need a very robust concept. I, I, I don't think I'm raising my children to exercise free will. I'm raising them to pursue the goods requisite of the good life. Mm -hmm. yeah. And do you see what I mean? So when I ask, when I ask my son Cormac, you know, why did you you know, why were you late? Why, why are you late coming home? If you said, well, because I willed to do so, so free of, of external causal influence, I would say you have not answered the question, right? right. <laughs> what, what possible good were you trying to operate by? Yeah. You see what I mean? So I think, I think in a lot of ways, we overestimate the role that something like undetermined to free will actually plays in the good human life. Mm -hmm. No, I, yeah, that's, I think that's interesting. I think that's worth, that. that's definitely yeah, that's worth, awesome side, yeah. no, but I mean, it's, yeah, it is in a sense, but I think it's worth looking at because I think yeah. it also brings you back into this kind of teleological understanding of that you're seeking after something, you're, you're, you're going somewhere. I'm training my children to maneuver in the world we've inherited, right, to operate according to the vision of the good life that we've inherited from our biological history, from our cultural history, to pursue certain goods, right? Not... Mm -hmm to perform unconstrained act of will. Right. Well, and that's, I think, you know, I talked, I've talked about this on the podcast before. I mean, this is, Ratzinger deals with this in Truth and Tolerance. Yeah. Where he actually goes to the, he, you know, he's very precise too. So mm -hmm. sometimes when he speaks in bombastic language, it's always worth paying attention to because yeah, yeah. he doesn't do that so often. But he deals with this idea of freedom and, and kind of how freedom is the theme of modernity. Yes. And it's a disordered freedom. And he goes through everything from Luther and the Protestant Reformation 
doubt, you know, existentialism, et cetera. And that freedom is reduced to simply a radical exercise of the will. Right. And he, he says that that's a diabolical concept of freedom, right? Which are, which are strong words. It's a diabolical yeah. concept wow. of freedom because it's actually destructive. Yeah. Because mere exercise of the will is irrational. Because he says an irrational will is not a free will. And so an irrational will by not being a free will means if you're simply exercising your will, right? Separate from reason. The example I give, uh, I mean, listeners have probably heard this many times, so uh, forgive me. But the example I always give is if I start banging my head on the edge of a table, no one looks at me and thinks, wow, Michael's so free. He's so free. But, I'll prove but, I'm free. See, I'll prove you I'm free, right? Exactly. So because an irrational will is not a free will. So it's a diabolical concept. And so I think you're right. I mean, that, that would be a, a nice, good, I think, subject for a podcast. It's just on what does it mean to have a free will? Yeah. And what does it mean to choose well of the good life yeah. and to use your will? How do you say to maneuver in, yeah, maneuver in the world maneuver. we live in with taking into account our embodied, embedded yeah. nature? Yeah. I like to think about it in terms of Oedipus Rex. Mm -hmm. oh, and I, I go off on this in the new book quite a bit. Is, is Okay, so Oedipus is trapped in a fate, right? Mm -hmm. His yep. freedom has been undermined. But when you read the narrative, I mean, it's pretty, I mean, he, he, he knew that he knew the prophecy. Mm -hmm. He knew this woman that he married looked a hell of a lot like him. You have to think, I mean, it's, it, it's, it's all there. Okay. Mm -hmm. So like he's what, blind to him. He's, he's blinded himself. He's blinded before himself. he's blind. Yeah. And so, you know, what is, so the, the threat to our freedom isn't some determining cause that the neurosciences are going to discover. Right. The threat to our freedom is our unwillingness to look at ourselves and our world and to authentically own up to, you know, what our real motivations of things are and are ignoring the actual goods that are before us in favor of other goods, et cetera, et cetera. Do, do you see my point? Absolutely. Or yeah, choosing so, lesser goods, right? But choosing I lesser, mean, yeah. You know, again, Von Hildebrand actually has this distinction where he talks about the subjectively satisfying, the genuinely beneficial, and the intrinsic value. Yeah. Which is kind of, I think, like an Arist I think it actually parallels with Aristotelian like concepts of yeah. friendship. And so, yeah. so I, I read the Nicomachean Ethics as a reply to Sophocles. Oh, that's and interesting. Reply, it's in conversation with it. Yeah. Right? How would we avoid tragedy? Yeah. Well, that's interesting too, because you could also look at the at the Ten Commandments and the broader six hundred thirteen commandments, but the broader Mosaic Law. So first the Noahide Law, and then Mosaic Law, and then the Christian Law, if you want to call it that as the same thing, right? right. Like Deuteronomy is just like, do this and you will see, be seen to be a wise people, right. right? Follow these. And so a lot of it's like removing iniquity and operating a certain way. So in a sense, there's two kinds of tragedy, that which just happens. And then the tragedy that happens because you made all these bad choices, that you were, right. you were morally blind, if you yeah. want to put it in that language. So I, I think of freedom now as this ability to take responsibility for the world I've inherited, to put it in question, right? And to, to, to sort of be willing to like, like ask those kinds of difficult questions that we talked about earlier. Yeah. And that's why, oh yeah, I think that's really good. That's why you need to be embedded. Exactly. Because if you're not embedded, then you, do, then you don't even know the questions to ask. Yeah, like right. I was talking to, I did a podcast with uh, Noel Maring who wrote a book called The Wake Not Woke you know, on kind of a personalist alternative to like the dominant social justice. Mm -hmm. And I, I brought this up twice, but like I used to say when I used to teach undergraduate philosophy, you don't know Nietzsche, but he knows you. Right. If we're not aware of where we are and our tradition and also the, the dangers of that tradition, then we are in this kind of, what do you call it, like a digital nihilism. Yeah. That's not exactly your word, but... Techno nihilism. Techno nihilism, yeah. Yeah. Okay, so yeah, no, I think that's good on, on free will. I mean, we could have maybe a longer yeah. conversation on but... I would love to, yeah. Yeah, no, because it's a really, menu building here. I like oh, it. I, I like it. You're going to be like regular guest. I love it's it. It's going to be awesome. So we have the, the materialist side. Let's just go quickly over the dualist side, and then we'll kind of go circle back to this idea of mind, mm -hmm. uh, of hylomorphism, how it does, and then also some of the new things you're working on with participation, which you've already alluded to a little bit. Sure. So what, let's, talk, let's look at the, at the dualistic side. Sure. And, and sort of the concerns I have about dualism. That, is yeah. That, yeah. Yeah. Like your kind of critique of dualism and why yeah, you think so, it doesn't satisfy. At the, well, one, I mean, I think this is more in my recent thought than in the, in the first book, but, you know, I'm not sure how intuitively satisfying dualism is to me. I, I mean, I, I do think I experience myself as, you know, a 180 pound ape involved in a world that I did. You see what I mean? And so I, mm -hmm. I, 
at the end of the day, I'm not sure what, intuitively how much I wouldn't maybe fall more towards a material view. Okay. But also, I don't you, think... You think you'd be more you'd be more material then? Yeah. Yeah. And at least... And I think it has a lot to do with my experience of fatherhood. Okay. And just... And what am I raising my children to do is to occupy this world. Like, they take up this inheritance, not to separate themselves, abstract themselves from it. Okay. But that... I mean, that's... But that's neither here nor there because I can't really... That's just my intuition. Okay. Mm-hmm. My worry about dualism in, in, in all its forms, though, more like technically, is just no matter what, you're going to end up saying there's this efficient causal relationship between mind and body. Okay. And then you're going to have competing causal explanations for the very same events that are going to go on, you know, within the human body. Okay. So just break that a little bit. So the efficient cause is like the third cause of, of air, so like the carpenter. Yeah. So why don't, you, why don't you just break it out a little bit? Or, yeah. So if, if we say, you know, my mind is this thing that is distinct from my body, mm-hmm. okay, and then we say, my mind makes my decisions, right, but my brain doesn't, okay, but then there's going to be an event in my brain that is the initiation of the downward chain of, cause, of, of physical effects that lead to my, my movement, right? Mm-hmm. And the problem is, is, you know, we can, we can find what is likely the prior physical cause to that downward chain within the brain, okay? Mm-hmm. So then it does seem that you've, uh, you've got this com- two competing explanations for the exact same event that's going to go on in the brain, okay? And so dualism is going to have to come with this problem. Like, like, like there's always going to be these two proposals, right? One of which we empirically verify and one of which we, we can like philosophically verify. And how we link that up is this, it's just, it just is Descartes' mind-body problem. And I don't think there's been a fully satisfactory solution to that. And I think it's a, was it Ed Fazer in this book on conscious that you know that yeah. collected collection of consciousness where he makes the case like what's the how do we solve the mind body problem he said there isn't one yeah yeah I mean right I mean like yeah. hylomorphism I mean t- I mean I know that's a little bit no, 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 shorthand no. but it's like no there isn't a fine body problem because it's like using the Bennett like there's a conceptual error at the beginning you've created a false Don't take the bait yeah exactly Don't so take the bait. and also when you get into stuff well. I won't, let's hold off on free will because I, hold on. <laughs> well, no, I mean, go a little bit. We'll take just, because it's, I think it's interesting to talk about it. We just talked about the materialist side. Let's look at the dualist yeah. side for a second. Well, so when, like when you, when you look at stuff like the Liebet experiments, you know, where it seems that the conscious act of the will, right, which is supposedly this non-physical thing is happening after the fact. So it's really not the cause of the downward chain. It seems that the downward chain's already been caused before the conscious act of will happens. At least that's one interpretation of the Leibit experiments, right? Yeah, the readiness potential. You know, the Libet or Libet says Libet, however you say his name. Yeah, I, I botched it. I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. So whatever. <laughs> I'm not sure. But he actually argues that there is free will. Yeah, he does. He does. Yeah. And interestingly, in the readiness potential study, I talk about this with Dr. Yeah. Michael Egnor, it doesn't happen with won't. Right. So he actually says there's so maybe some evidence of free won't. But but right. But I think the point you're you're making though is that the dualist problem, you're kind of oh well, there's maybe there's just another cause we haven't seen, another physical cause we haven't seen, another physical cause we haven't seen. And so I think it's a reasonable position for the materialist to say, look, I mean, we don't I mean, again, correct me if you think it's wrong, but I think a reasonable critique of dualism for the materialist. And by the way, in this book, I mean, you you spend a lot of time taking very seriously right. materialism in its different forms. Yes. And Tediously so, yeah. What's that? Tediously so. Yeah, well, but important. I mean, I, just for listeners, I mean, we're just saying materialism and dualism, but I mean, you spend... What? Let's see, I can... Okay. Like six variations of each or something. Like that. Oh, yeah, you, said, you spend 200 plus pages going over all these things of materialism, dualism, the different kinds, emergent, functionalism. I mean, all these different things. You look at it, you have the dualist critique of materialism, the materialist critique of dualist. I mean, so, I, you know, we're doing it quickly here on the podcast, but if you're interested in this, read the book because he's going over it quickly. But, I mean, he's, we're going over it quickly, but, he, but, you know, Jim, you go over it really in detail. But what I was saying, though, not to overly simplify, is that, I mean, I think, it's a realistic materialist critique to say, well, I mean, you just keep saying that there's something else. Yeah. But every 10 or 20 years, we find a new explanation. Yeah. And then you just keep pushing that thing back, pushing that thing, pushing that thing back. Yeah. And I think that's because, I think this is important insight that I really, I hadn't thought of until I read your book until you're saying it here that that's because dualism and materialism are both mechanistic. They are. They and are. that's why they're, they're both like, fighting each other. And the answer is don't take the bait. 
Don't they're both conceptually erroneous. Yeah. There's a much more philosophically sound and articulation that is much more in line with our lived experience as human exactly. beings exactly. and that helps us understand nature better. And that's yeah. hylomorphism. And, and that's sort of the virtue of hylomorphism, one of the many virtues, is it's, part, it's not an ad hoc story about humans. If you understand how Aristotle gets there, it's a generalized account about mobile, changing beings that he then works into, you know, applies as an account to living things, and then eventually applies as an account to human beings. Right. It's a, it's Whether a, trees change, yeah, humans change, yeah, living things change. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I, I, I think that's a good way to put it. It's not an ad hoc story. And by the way, it's very interesting. I mean, I know this is this is a big statement, and I know there's a lot there, but neither is Genesis. <laughs> sure. Sure. Right? Because you're made out of the dust of the earth. Dust. Dust. Right? Made out of the dust of the earth really matters. Yeah. All right. And um, and so it's not an ad hoc story uh, either, which I think Genesis is much more profound than I think we give it credit for. So, mm -hmm. all right. So so then this dualistic element, did you want to say we jumped into free will, but the, the, mm -hmm. you find the dualism not, there's a mind-body problem. How does the mind communicate with the body? And this is, the, this is a problem since Descartes. Yeah. And so the way around it is there isn't one. There isn't one. And I, I say that because it's not just like, oh, that doesn't matter. It's really an argument that, and this is what I think you're doing, is saying there's no mind-body problem. But wait, I'm going to tell you why there's no mind-body problem. Yeah. Because you're not simply rejecting it. You're going to Aristotelian and later Thomistic philosophy of nature. Right. And now if you have this concept of nature, now you don't have a mind-body problem. Is that right? Right. I got okay. So why don't you go through just quickly the last part about hylomorphism and how it relates to philosophy of mind? Sure. Um, you know, so going back to things we said earlier. So you know, what is it to be uh, a human being? Well, it's to be matter. You know, with the human soul. Okay. Well, what's a human soul? It's it's the relatedness of the parts, as we put it, right, mm -hmm. towards some sort of end. Okay. And you know, what is that end? Well, it's the good life for humans. All right, okay. But what is the good life for humans? Well, it's it's going to be, you know, human growth, human reproduction, human eating, human fighting, you know, all the stuff that humans do as, as a kind of ape and all that. But also, you know, like all conscious animals, it's going to develop a certain kind of consciousness, right? And in the human case, it's going to be to develop a kind of consciousness that is capable of self-criticism, that doesn't just, in say, in Bob's case, do the chameleon thing, Right. Because that's what chameleons do. It's going to put the human thing into question, right? Because that's what humans do. Because that's what humans do, right? You know, Aristotle, you know, what is the good life for Aristotle? It's the life lived according to reason, right? Right. Which I think you can read that saying it's the life that asks what is the good life. Right. Which is, by the way, interesting because the definition of sin in the mm -hmm. catechism of the Catholic Church, the first, do you know what the first line is in the definition mm -hmm. of sin? Sin is an offense against reason. Uh, nice, right? And you can see that it's, it's we're not talking about math there necessarily, right? Right, no, <laughs> yeah. right. It's a failure Reason is beyond empirical, yeah. Yeah. That's a theme. It's a theme. Right? <laughs> I talk about that all the time. <laughs> it's like, if I said it right now, all the listeners who listen regularly, like, okay, we know. Just keep going and let them keep going. So I'm not going to even say that reason goes beyond the empirical. That's it. I'm done. Okay. No, keep, but yeah, keep going. Duly noted, though. Duly noted. <laughs> so, so, you know, what, what, what is it? So from the, very, from the moment you have a human organism, you have something that is disposed, right? That is disposed to reach the point where it can ask, what is the good life, right? But, you know, as I'll point out, that, that asking of what is the good life, that is human-mindedness, okay? And that's something we do always in participation with our biological history, our cultural history, our shared history uh, of family, community, culture, city, nation, all that. Okay. And so I see then what mind, what having a mind is, is not having a special kind of entity. It's being related to the world in a special way, right? It, in, the, in the human mind, it's to be related to the world such that we could be critical of the world that we inherit. Okay. Why don't you develop that a little bit more? Yeah. So, um, you know, in a way, so if you think of it, um, this is a famous example. There's a, there's a kind of tick, right? That under, my understanding of it is, is it, it structures its whole world around uh, the levels of mammalian skin acid in its environment. Okay. So much so that it can time its jump on you 
by how much of that acid is in the air. Okay. I find that cool. Okay. Mm -hmm. And that's its whole world. Okay. Those entities come to the fore for it. That's its whole world. Okay. So what is it to be that tick in a lot of ways? It's just be related to the skin acid. Okay. What is it to be human? Well, it's to be related to certain things that fulfill our needs. Okay. But note for humans, one of our needs is to ask the question of what the good life is. Okay. And it requires us to relate ourselves to these principles of logic now, these principles of reason now, these these principles of of uh, moral rationality, all these things. Do you, do you um, I, and can I can I jump yeah. in and, yeah. and again disagree? I think it there's something here that we we haven't spent a lot of time on, but mm-hmm. part of the kind of thing we are is we're a subject, a unique, unrepeatable subject, right? And other people are also subjects. Right. And so we're in this embeddedness, part of what it is to lead a good life is to live as you are a subject and treat other people like they're subjects. And it's an offense against reason to treat other people like objects when they're not simply things. Exactly. Because because think of it this way. So so I have to ask myself, what is, like what what are we set up to do? We're like we're we're set up to take second order stances towards ourselves. Okay. That's why we're different. And taking that second order stance myself, I'm going from being being merely sentient to being what Robert Brandom calls sapient, okay? And that means I'm making the logic, the normative structure of human life explicit so we can ask ourselves whether we're satisfying those norms or whether those are good norms. It's interior, like Voitio would call that interiority. Yeah, I like that, yeah. But no, for me to do that and for it not just to be my own fantasy, I have to push it against you too. Mm -hmm. I need to do it. A man alone is a beast or a god, as Aristotle puts it, okay? So what I always, so I have to be able to see other human beings as a kind of equal to me in doing mm-hmm. this, in making explicit the norms that govern my life, right? It's always our life that they govern. Does that make sense? Mm-hmm. And so what I'm getting at is, is, is whereas like say the, the tick, all its world is built around, all that's in its environment is say the skin acid, okay? It's not related to anything eternal, okay? Whereas the human being, in our environment, for us to do what we do, we have to relate ourselves to norms. We have to relate ourselves to logical principles, relate ourselves to things that if they are what we think they are, they're eternal. Right. Okay. So let me let me yeah. push on that for a second. So mm-hmm. I'm Catholic, great, eternal, woohoo. But I mean, that's a pretty big jump. I mean, say if I'm listening to this podcast and let's say I'm not a believer, not a materialist. Yeah. And kind of like, okay, I'm, I'm sympathetic to this hylomorphic idea. But now all of a sudden, I mean, you're just kind of throwing eternity in there. Yeah. What do you say to that? Where does that come from? McIntyre ended his last book with, therein begins natural theology. Okay. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and, and so in the way, the way I end you know, the, the book I just finished is to say, look, I think I've motivated that, that materialism is wrong. I think I've motivated that like a facile dualism is wrong. Okay. But also I've said like, you know, what is human humanity? It's the being for whom being is the issue. It's the being for whom the good life is an issue. It's the being that asks questions, asks questions. And the question is, is, do we come to rest? (laughs) Right. Is there something eternal that we can latch onto? Because if there is, then that would seem to be good news. But I think to ask that is to ask whether or not, you know, we can answer that even bigger question, which is the question of natural theology. Mm -hmm. Do you see that? Yeah. So I don't, I don't, what I'm pointing to is like, we can't answer that. Like, I don't think we can answer the question ultimately that we're looking for in philosophical anthropology without answering the natural theological question. So in simple terms, philosophical anthropology leads us to a point where it's the appropriate thing for us to do to engage in these larger questions. Yes. And now we're engaging in natural theology. Let, yes. let me ask. I mean, okay. just to make it explicit, like if you're going to ask me, is there human immortality? I need to, and then ask, is there deity right what is immortality what is transcendent what is immortal why do i have a sense of the immortal yes right and the kind of eo wilson type materialism that says well morality is just an illusion fobbed off on you by your genes and it's just insufficient number one how'd you ever figure that out if it's yeah. an illusion how did would, how'd you separate yourself out of the human race to figure that illusion yeah. but second of all it's just kind of a, a discarding of a real question that you see Throughout time, throughout peoples, throughout cultures. That's what this kind of thing that we call human beings are always doing. They're yeah. always asking this question about norms and eternity and everything else, right? Yeah. And that's and so 
even if that doesn't give us an answer, it does at least give us a direction of the kind of thing we are, as yeah. opposed to Bob the chameleon. And that the kind of materialist Lyle is just an illusion. It not only is it an incoherent position because you wouldn't be able to know that, but it also just, it also, I think, goes back to, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but it goes back to your first point about the nihilism of being what I call disembed or embedded. It's disembodied, disembedded. Exactly. That's the problem with kind of dominant materialism is it's hubristic and disembedded. Exactly. Like, yes. you know, and I'm so, I mean, I'll be a little bit harsh here, but like, give me a break. I mean, come yeah. on. Like, like we're dealing with really, ex like I had, a, I had a philosophy professor once and I, I was, I wrote a, a paper. Okay. You're going to like this. You can use it. I wrote a paper in graduate school. And I, I made this line. I said this line. I forget what it was about. About something with like St. Thomas. And I mean, this is why Avil is a privation or something. Mm -hmm. something, yeah, something. Yeah. And I went on. And this is what he wrote on the side. I love it. Ooh, Miller the Magnificent solves <laughs> excruciatingly difficult philosophical problems in a few glib one-liners. I am going to use that. That's awesome. Is that the best? I mean, yeah. like I was, I laughed out loud. I was like, let me just say, I was like, oh, that's true. And I cut it. Right. And, and so I don't, you know, I know these are complex things, but I mean, that's kind of the, one of my, like, this is where I get irritated with materialism. Like, you know, wow, that's a really excruciatingly complex human problem that people have been wrestling with in ancient civilizations for millennia. And we're just like, oh no, we've solved. It's just an illusion oh, of turn, your biology. Turns I out mean, we're over it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's like, yeah. give me a break. I mean, it's so intellectually unserious. And I, but, I think though, I think part of it is is we are not comfortable with being the being for whom being is an issue. No. Okay. And so we want a glib answer. Yeah. And materialism is a good glib answer. And so is dualism. And I think that's one of the reasons why we're so quick, even those of us who are in materialism, to turn everything into substance dualism. Okay. Yeah. And I'm at a point now where I'm happy to say, you know, I, I don't know that I can give you a story about human nature that adds up completely. And for me, you know, philosophical anthropology does end up open-ended and does leave me waiting for the results of maybe another kind of inquiry. Mm -hmm. Before we finish, let me, let me ask, let me push on a couple of things. So mm -hmm. I've just given a critique of materialism mm -hmm. and you followed along saying, well, yeah, that's why, you know, materialism and, and, and sorry, and dualism are kind of glib answers. Mm -hmm. But a lot of people would say, well, you guys are Catholics. I mean, give me a break. Talk about a glib answer. I mean, you just like, well, how would you respond to somebody who said that Judaism or Catholicism is a glib answer? I have to be in a world. I have to inherit something. I have to start from somewhere. And where I start is, is that, right? That, that's what I've inherited. That, do you see, do you see my point is... But, but, but you didn't just, I mean, you're a philosopher. You didn't just inherit it and say, oh yeah, okay, this is where I am. I mean, you, you wrestled with it. Yes. Uh, but I mean, at, at the end of the day, I mean, I think my wrestling with it isn't done. Okay. And it will never be done. Mm -hmm. Okay. But I go to mass still yeah. because I have to be a good termite. I have to follow some set of instructions. <laughs> Do you see that? Mm -hmm. And that lets me be able to put it into question in ways, but I have to, I have to live a life. I have to be in a world. Yeah. Do you see what I mean? And so like, like I think th th I, you can, there's, a, there's a kind of a Catholic apologetic going on in this, okay, that, that, that we have to inherit something. If we don't inherit something, we can't even get mindedness off the ground. Mm -hmm. You know, Carlo Lancelotti, who's the translator of Augusto Don Noche, mm -hmm. I interviewed him and uh, he actually, we ended the, con the conversation. Um, you should listen to it. Mm -hmm. actually. I'll check it out now. Yeah. yeah. And give it a five-star review. I, will. All right, so, I, I, have, I have to make a long, I have to do a car drive that one of my kids track means tomorrow. So I'm going to, I'm going to be checking you out tomorrow. All right. So, yeah, okay. Yeah. So, <laughs> so, but you know, at the end, Carlo says, he's talking about Del Noche and also his own work. He's a physicist in mm -hmm. New York. That key to this is the que asking questions. Yes. And what ideology does is it's a suppression of questions. Yes. And I think, and I think this is where, in, in a sense, there's something like philosophical, right? That is a, the love of wisdom. And I think this goes back to, which I really like this point. Like you can't do philosophy unless you're embodied and embedded. Exactly. And you, so Catholicism, like in a sense, we're always wrestling with it. Right. But contrary to the, to the kind of image, it's, it's not simply this dogmatic exception. It's actually a deeply philosophical project. 
And right. it's supposed to be inside, right? I mean, if you read the church fathers and the church doctors, and, and like, mm-hmm. there's belief, there's, there's wrestling, and there's, it's, it's philosophical. And I've talked about this before. It's not a theory of everything. It's not an ideological, you know, ni- neat package yeah. to solve the world's problems. The church has uh, an answer for everything. No, don't put it that way. No, it doesn't. Absolutely not. No, no, no. Because it's, it, and that's, I think, a danger of our, I, I, so, so, okay, so uh, we could talk about that more, but. I, my point is, like, if you ask me, why am I Catholic? Because I, I need to be embedded. I need to be embedded in something. Yeah, and it seems like I would say, and it, it from in my experience, which is it brings a broad world, enough, but not it brings to, entities yeah. to me. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I'd say it's also the it's the best answer I've seen. Yeah, like I, I mean, there's a lot of answers. Yeah. You know, I, I lived in Japan five years. I've lived in yeah. different places. Yeah. I've seen different things. There's a lot of attempted answers. I think Catholicism is the most is the most reasonable articulation. Now, I will also say, and I think this is like super important because both of us are kind of philosophically minded. I mean, I also think mm-hmm. faith is a gift. Yeah. It's very clear. That's a part of the tradition that faith is a gift. So I don't simply believe because I've done all this work. I inherited it right. from my family, yeah. but I also inherited, I would say, a gift of faith. And right. so we could talk about that more, but let me, I may push on another thing. So mm-hmm. dualism, uh, we'll, we'll end here pretty quickly. Uh, thanks for your time. So, but dualism, people would say, well, wait a minute. I mean, what do you mean? I mean, there's a soul and there's a body. Mm-hmm. St. Thomas Aquinas says like, I'm not my soul, which is important, right? I'm mm-hmm. not simply my soul, but we have a soul, we have a body. Mm-hmm. Like we die, our soul gets judged, goes to heaven. Mm-hmm. Now in the, re- in the Catholicism, the resurrection of the body is really important because I think it's an affirmation of hylomorphism, right? We get yeah. our bodies back. Bodies aren't accidents. Yeah. It's not, it's not we're, we're not in a Gnostic or Manichaean view that like somehow our body, we have to escape from our body. Nope, we get our body back. Aquinas says death is the most unnatural thing. But there seems to be a very clear distinction in Aquinas, who's a hylomorphist, yeah. between the soul and the body. And that we, do we have a soul? Yeah. How, how do you, what do you say to that? So, um, yeah, I don't have a comfortable answer to that now. Okay. And basically, you know, what I've done is I, I've kind of rewound. I've, I've kind of gone back. I, so, I, you know, I, I wrote a book on Helen Morris. I wrote a book defending Thomas's view. And I think what I did in that book is defensible. Though looking back on it, you know, 10 years later, it feels too dualist to me now. Okay. And so I started over and I went back and, I, and I've, I've been rereading Aristotle and working my way back and writing about that again. And, and I've, I've encountered phenomenology in a way and I'm looking back into it. Does that make sense? Right. Mm-hmm. Well, so, so I think I've said this once in another podcast. Mm-hmm. I was interviewing a Dominican. Mm-hmm. I don't know if that's, your bias, yours might come out first. So, but anyway, but uh, I asked this question, which is, do you think St. Thomas, if he came back and was hanging out with all these Thomists would say like, what's wrong with you guys? Like, what'd you do? And, you know, and I kind of give the, you know, how Gandalf runs out to go study all the things that happened to figure out what's going on. St. Mm-hmm. Thomas would like go into the libraries, come across Descartes and say, oh, I know what happened. <laughs> yeah, right? I mean, yeah, like yeah. something happened, like in a sense that Thomas would think, like if you think of Bennett and Hacker's book, which I think is excellent, do you think Thomas would read Bennett and Hacker's book? Like, yeah, it's not just the, it's not just the neuroscientists that are dualists. The Thomists are dualists. Yeah. I mean, I know that's a strong question, but I mean, I think I wonder if we're just, we're so shaped by it that it's hard for us almost to have the imagination to rethink something outside of dualism. Exactly. What do you think? Yeah, I, I think I worry that the author of Mind, Matter, and Nature was too dualist. That'd be you, yeah. Yes. Right. <laughs> right. Well, I mean, I, I think I'm too dualist too. I mean, I think... Yeah. It, it, because it's tough though. I mean, like, let's, I think we can, I like how you said you don't have an answer. Like, yeah, yeah we, so quote, we quote, have a soul. Mm-hmm. Well, I'm, and then Thomas says, I'm not my soul. But I'm not. And then no. who is this, like, so this is from Ben and Hacker. Who is this self that has a brain? Yeah. Who is this self that has yeah. the soul? Yeah. What does it mean to have, like, and I think some of it's the, uh, some of it is really pushing really complex questions of what does it mean to be an embodied person? And, and they're tough. Um, right. You know, we were talking before and you mentioned Plato and, and, uh, and the Phaedo and the myths. Yeah. You were just saying, I thought that was kind of yeah. interesting about how well, do you wrestle yeah. with questions and that there's difficult questions that sometimes we just can't fully articulate. But, and I'm going to jump here and say, that doesn't mean therefore materialism is true. I mean, no. like, that's not even close to true. Like, yeah. it, it's like, let me, let me give one parallel and, and then go to the Phaedo. I, I, um, I've talked about this before. Beauty is objective and we have a subjective experience of it. Yeah. And that means 
if we're going to talk about beauty, it's going to be hard and complex without a simple glib answer. But that's much more rewarding and beautiful and accurate to reality than just simply saying, well, it's just an eye of the beholder. Yes. Right. And yeah. I would say there's a kind of a parallel to this. Like, yeah, I don't, I don't know. I don't know. Yeah, I mean, so in the, in the point about the Fado, exactly. So you, 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 go, you go through Plato's Fado and you get all these arguments that he's trying to prove the immortality of the soul and they're kind of, mm, they're okay, okay, you know, and, but they, they leave you some suspicions. It would be hard to take the trip through the Fado and still be a materialist, okay? But whether he's made any sense at all, what he means by immortality is far from clear. And, you know, the, the youngsters that, he's, that Socrates is talking to, you know, say, yeah, you've kind of convinced us, but... What the heck are you talking about? And what's he do? He tells him a myth. He tells him a myth. And it's the conventional myth that he's inherited as an Athenian about the afterlife and all this. And at the end of it, there's this very interesting line I never noticed until I recently taught the Phaedo again, you know, 25 years doing it, right? Where, you know, Plato says, you know, it would be foolish to insist, to insist, not to, not to think it's true, but to insist that it were true. But it's a fair bet because this is, this is all we can do, right? And I think I think this is you know this is sort of where piety comes in. This is where revealed religion comes in, right? It gives me a story about these things, an assurance of where the right answer lies that may be beyond the human can entirely, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, and so like as we talked about, but it's like foolish to insist that this is exhausts the fullness of what exactly. you think it is. Yeah, and I think as you were talking earlier, there is a point where natural theology and where revelation comes in. Yes, and then you have the question, no one has a full-fledged, perfect, exhaustive answer to the deepest questions of our human existence. Right. But what I think the hylomorphic idea does gets us to this most aligned with our lived experience as right. persons and best kind of model for thinking about the good life and gets us to this position of natural theology and openness to revelation. Exactly. Exactly. What? Very well put. So... There's more we could talk about. I, I wanted to get in a little bit of some of the biggest critiques of hylomorphism. Uh, now you got to have me back. You're I'll have to have you back. I have to have you back. I, 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 it's going to be great. Plus, we're going to talk about your book on ageless athlete. And so, mm -hmm. since I'm aging, I need to read that. Um, yeah, me too. So, I'm, <laughs> but I, I really like just the end, end actually, mm -hmm. which is great. Um, at the end of your book, you're talking about. Uh, you say, as long as some of us have the leisure to spend our lives philosophizing, there'll always be controversy around human nature. Be that as it may, at some point, you'll need to come to a conclusion as to which position in the philosophy of mind is actually is intellectually superior. It would be a shame to spend your entire life without coming to any conclusion as to what kind of being you are. That's great. Yeah. That's really good because I would say, you know, one of the big problems we have in philosophical anthropology, everybody says like, be who you are, follow your passions, do it. Well, what kind of being am I? Right. What does it mean to like be the best I can be and be who I am? And best what does that what? mean? Yeah. What is What's it? that? Best at what? Right. And, and I think that's the, in a sense, maybe this circles back. That's why people are in a position of, of nihilism and some despair is we've lost the self. Yes. Yeah, my, my uh, friend, Rabbi Mitch Rocklin, who I'm hoping to get on the podcast, he actually makes the argument, we've lost God because we lost man. Love it. Right? Usually it's like, oh, we lost God, then we lost man. Yeah. He says, no, we, we lost man, and now we've lost God because we don't know who we are. Yeah. And I think that that kind of aligns with that. Like, it's a shame to spend your entire life without coming to a conclusion of what kind of being you are. And I think that's why, you know, anthropology and the theme of this podcast is like, what does it mean to be a human person? And the answers are not simple, um, but... I think this is a really good book. I highly recommend it. Thank you. And uh, thanks for coming on the podcast. Yeah, thank you. And I hope we can do it again. Absolutely. All right. Well, we'll talk to you soon.